Thank you. Ah, there's Mel Mel. Welcome on the show. So okay, hi and welcome. Well. Well, it's it's good to be here. It's definitely good to be. Um, here. I, I had some questions and things that I wanted to talk about. I'll just type in your name, and then okay. we'll go from there. And we'll we'll go from there. Joey, um, I'll just I can put the YouTube link for the channel itself in the description box. Do you no, think I, I, I reach I reshared it actually, so I know. Hey, I'm running the ticker for shout outs down below periodically, and it's going now. Oh, that's cool. That's cool. What I wanted to, what I wanted to ask you about is um you talked something about bonding as far as mm -hmm. the service dogs i wanted to know if it's possible you could talk more about that as about how, how was the bonding process and what probably what's the difference between somebody who has a regular dog that's not trained i mean i know a little bit about this but versus somebody who has a service dog i guess for the people that don't know okay um i talked a little bit about that but it may have gotten caught in the lag um bonding is huge now, Candy the Wee Service Dog, Laurel made the very good point that they want to feel safe. So the first mm -hmm. thing that you do to help them feel safe is to make sure, like with humans, that basic needs are met, food, water, shelter. And with a service dog, that shelter may include a crate that they can go in and out of anytime mm -hmm. they want. Not necessarily yeah. one that you put a padlock on, but <laughs> yeah, one yeah. that, because that becomes their room. And we like having our bedrooms. So yes. the little crate becomes their room. So they can go in and out. Gives them a feeling of security. Yes. Um, also, being around the human all the time and um, along with the security being fed on a schedule. Like, you always mm -hmm. want to leave out water. Always. But, you know, for Tomlin, my previous service dog, it was mm -hmm. once in the morning, once at night, at about the same time. And he developed this little routine that was based around our lives and our routine. For example, he knew that at 11 p.m. we should be heading to bed. <laughs> and, <laughs> and if we didn't, if we weren't going that way uh, fast enough to suit him, he would come over and he would start head bumping. And so I would be like on the computer typing away. And all of a sudden my arms going this way because there's a nose going, Hey, you know, it's time. I've had it with you. Go to bed. Um, <laughs> you know. So is, is it the same thing waking up? Pretty much. Yes. You know, so so like an alarm clock. we wake up at different hours and he also, picks up on our behavior. So it was so funny because Sunday mornings, you know, we had a different routine because we would get ready to go to church and it was just like instinctively he would, yeah. well, he would see me lay out the clothes the night before. And that's like the only time that I do that because I'm pretty lazy. And so he would see me take the outfit and lay it out. And so the next morning, um, he associated, and so the next morning he was waking me up at an earlier time, you know. And of course, they also learned that if the alarm clock goes off, it's time to get up. So if you hit that snooze button too many times, he's over it. He was like, nope, you got to get up. So that all was, you know, part of helping him feel safe was sticking to that routine. And so he he did that like i said around our lives so um yeah so that was the well, first thing go ahead mm -hmm. no 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 go ahead go, go. i want to finish i already know what i was going to say okay um the other thing was playing with him and playing with a service dog doesn't always mean playing with fluffy stuffed animals and squeak toys but you know dropping a prescription bottle he got to where he knew that sound and he would come running in uh, because he knew that I needed that retrieved. So for him, that was part of the playtime. So for him to go get the bottle and then be petted up 
you know, great big, you know, good boy, great job, that kind of thing. Um, he associated that pretty quickly with, oh, when I do this, you know, I get extra attention. That's kind of cool. So that helped also. So go ahead. Well, I, I see that because I, I, I work with a lot of police and they have the um, bomb sniffing dogs. And from what they were telling me, it's kind of the same process to where they don't just feed the dog every time. The dog has to do something first to get petted up, to get rewarded. Right. And then it goes from there. And then how you deal with them. Yeah, you could pet them, but you don't treat them like the same dog because you ha they have a job to do. So, so you have to give them the security. You have to give them the space, like what you were talking about. But there's a routine that they have to follow. And yes. if they break that routine, then they're no longer a service dog. You're domesticated. So it, it kind of defeats the purpose. So there's a lot of similarities when it comes to that. And they do yes. play certain games, you know, when it comes, like, to try to find, like, like with the bomb sniffing dogs, they don't eat unless they find something, you know. Okay. So, so it's, it's, it's a lot similar in that way. Well, with a home-based service dog, now we're not talking about canines, we're talking about just home-based service dogs, um, being fed at the same time every day sets mm -hmm. part of that routine. So that's part of them learning, you know, what you should do at a certain time. Yes, and, yes. You know, so for going to bed, they have this innate uh, built-in time clock so that around mm -hmm. 11, you know, we would go to bed a few times at around 11 and he's like, oh, okay, this is approximately this length of time from dinner. So it's time for them to go to bed. Bomb sniffing dogs are a little different, you know, because they have a life and death um, task that involves, you know, you're not just, if a bomb sniffing dog sniffs out a bomb, they're not saving just one life but possibly hundreds or thousands, depending on, you know, World Trade Center, um, mm -hmm. the bombing that they had there before the planes mm -hmm. hit it a few years. So, you know, yeah, the no, no, dog is yeah. just one person. So. No, 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 definitely, definitely. I, I, I see similarities, but there's definitely um, major differences. But you talked about the routine and you talked about, you know, what they help you do. Could you Could you speak on, how crucial that is for somebody who, who needs a service dog. And, and I mean, cause sometimes, you know, people that don't have service dogs, they may not understand how crucial um, a service dog is to the everyday life of a person that needs a service dog. It's vital in lots of ways, because if you need your service dog, for example, to remind you to take medication at a certain time, that dog's routine needs to stay the same. Now, it may vary a little bit, like different circumstances, traveling and whatnot, but the overall pattern of what you do in the day has to remain the same because the dog knows, okay, it's been approximately a certain amount of time since we did such and such activity. This is when the person needs to take their medications. I gotta go and remind them then in a little while later, they're like, because of their routine, they know, okay, this is the time where the person needs to do pick a, pick something. And mm -hmm. so they'll go and remind, but it, it's part of that routine. And then when they task, you have this other routine that you have to follow being for the prescription bottle. It hits the floor dog comes running in, dog hands it to you, you pet the dog up real big. So that's part of that routine. Mm -hmm. so yeah, so, so you're it's saying critical. it's like, it's just like things that people may forget and remember, especially somebody who may have Alzheimer's or something like that. They may need it at a certain time, you know, especially if they have like a another aid there, maybe somebody a home health aid there with the right. service dog. So there's different things. But I, I, and I want to know what are some of the biggest misconceptions, I guess, that may frustrate you when it comes to people, you know, th that you wish they understood about a service dog and what people needed needed to know. Don't pet the dog. Don't get upset when we say don't pet the dog, because especially kids, they see cute, fluffy dogs and they're magnets. So 
telling people don't pet the dog and getting them to understand why is one of my pet peeves. Now, mm-hmm. I don't I don't mind if a parent comes up to me and says, you know, please talk to my son about service dogs if you have time and if you don't mind so they'll understand how to behave. It's the ones that don't care and they just feel like it's a dog, it's in public, so they're entitled to pet it. Mm-hmm. Um, service dogs are very easy to ruin. When you go to a place with a service dog, there is a certain routine. If you go into a restaurant, the dog knows you're going to go in, you're going to sit, where you're going to sit. If it's a bench, he can go underneath the bench. Otherwise, you know, wherever, however you're trained uh, to do with that dog. Then you get up, you go to the table, you go to, when you get to the table, you get underneath the table and you stay there until human gets up, says forward, and then you go out. So you have that routine and the dog knows that routine. Mm -hmm. When you have somebody that comes up and they just start petting the dog, that breaks the routine. So the Mm -hmm. dog starts looking around at the restaurant and not paying attention to its handler. And if that happens so often, you might get by with it once, maybe twice, because the next time you go into a place, you're doing that routine again and you are correcting the service dog because he goes into the next restaurant and he's like, oh, I just got petted at the last restaurant. So this must mean when I go into restaurants, it's time to be petted. Can't do that. Um, And when people pet, it's, you know, they'll do things, especially kids. Sometimes when you teach dogs to sit, you press down on the back legs of the dog, the back hips, and say sit and press. And I've had a couple of kids try to do that. And I'm like, no. And that's because if you've got a mobility issue and you have to lean against your service dog and you've just had people come up a few times and in petting the dog, you know, little kids, they don't know. And elementary school kids, you know, they don't know that you don't automatically do that, but they see humans do it. So they're like, this must be part of how you treat a dog. Mm -hmm. And they'll go like, sit doggy, and they'll press. And so what happens then is when you fall, they've just had a human tell them to sit and put pressure on it. So when you fall, they think they're supposed to sit. Mm -hmm. And you both hit the floor. Yeah, and that's and that's defeats the purpose. Yeah. So getting people to understand why they can't interrupt a service dog when he's working is one of my pet peeves. And the other is ESAs, which stands for emotional assistance animals. Yeah. And, and they are in just a different class both legally and mentally. I don't mean that they're mentally whacked or anything, but the way you handle an ESA is not the same as you handle a service dog. And they don't require the same amount of training. With a service dog, the service dog has to be able to pass a public access test. ESAs don't. And that's why you can't take ESAs into places like restaurants, stores, and so forth. So what happens is, you know, you'll have an ESA go in and they'll act out in some way that a service dog would never act out. And then you come in and you've got a legit service dog. For example, we went to a restaurant. We came in with my dog. We went in, go straight to the table. He got under the table. The service dog, I mean service dog, the server sees my service dog's fluffy tail sticking out um, against the wall and he starts backing up and he's like, whoa, he said, you've got a dog. I'm not serving you. I will just have, you know, I'm going to talk to management 
if we can get somebody else to take your table, fine. Otherwise, you may have to leave. And I'm like, no, 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 no. You cannot make me leave. Well, come to find out in the conversation, somebody had brought an ESA in. And that ESA was eating from the table. And he said that the server got snapped at by the ESA. And he didn't want to get snapped at. He didn't want to risk getting bitten. Yeah. And he could blame him. So but because we were the next animal in after that, um, he automatically expected bad behavior out of my dog. And that set us up for difficulties with the server. Uh, It can set us up for difficulties with management. You know, you have ESAs that are not trained. Tomlin was attacked twice. He's had a couple had a couple of near misses where dogs just came up and started snarling at him and barking at him. And that's not good for a service dog either um, because when you go out with the service dog, then the service dog automatically expects the next dog that it sees to snap at it. So you have to go through some reprocessing there. So that's my two biggest. Well, you talked about ruining and and reprocessing. So, so when something like that happens, you know, how long does it usually take to reprocess or, you know, get the dog back on track normally? It depends on the dog and it depends on the on the situation. When we went to Alaska, Tomlin was attacked by an off leash dog, Um, dog, dogs, you know, attaches to his neck, that level. Um, And that was a, a husky. But we're also because the dog was so much bigger than Tomlin, Tomlin was 90 pounds. And he was not a little dog, but the other one came up to my hip. So because of the severity from then on, anytime he saw a husky mix, and we're assuming this was a husky wolf, um, he got, he would tense up. And if the dog came too close, maybe a couple of car lengths away, then he would start getting defensive and act out. And unfortunately, uh, we had that problem from then on. We desensitized some, but not fully. Uh, but what, do you we would, by, what do you mean by desensitize? What do you mean? Well, what we would do is whenever he saw another husky, we would automatically turn away uh, mm-hmm. the instant that the instant he saw the dog. Uh, okay. We would just kind of turn away. Um, so there was no actual interaction between him and the other husky. Um, and we did that. You, know, you don't here. We don't see huskies like every day. Okay. Um, had we been able to see a husky every day, it might have been different. So we can we continually, you know, would would turn him away. And that helped, but it didn't completely solve the problem. Uh, but, mm-hmm. you know, he had a little yappy dog come up um, at a state park. I was saying earlier that the woman had him on a very long retractable leash, but she wasn't paying attention to her dog. And oh, really? we, we were sitting down and the dog comes up and he's, he's like literally in my dog's face and it's barking and it's snapping and i tell my dog to ignore which means don't pay attention to what's going on around you focus on me mm-hmm. and so he wound up and he just kind of looked at the dog and he looked at me and he looked at the dog and he was like that all you got you know so he didn't make a move um, oh, but wow. had that dog been a husky and he had seen the husky then that would have been you know a different kind of situation Wow. So. Well, I wanted to address something that Kennedy was saying. She was saying some dogs are so traumatized that they have to be washed. It means uh, they have to be retired. Yes. Uh, so, so how? What is that process like? Um, that process is 
you find another service dog and sometimes you have to rehome the dog that you have to keep him from passing on his bad habits that he's learned from being attacked to the other dog. So what do you mean? What do you mean? So you're saying it's possible that another traumatized service dog could pass that on to a newer one? Dogs learn from each other in the same way that people learn from each other. Mm -hmm. So one dog seeing another dog that's within the same house. Okay. Same situation. Um, one dog seeing the other one react badly. He's learning from dog B is learning from dog A. Mm -hmm. So when he sees dog A exhibit bad behavior, he's learning that. So if you have a dog that is ruined in some way, then you may have to get dog out of A out of the picture to start completely over with dog B. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. And of course, that's lots of time, lots of money. And then you're out being able to be helped uh, during that time period. Thank you.